Um, well, I grew up in Labrador. Uh, I come from a family of miners. My grandfathers were both miners, and my dad was a miner. Uh, a hard life. They had a hard life. There, um, there were six of us uh, in eight years. And mom was Catholic, so uh, that's part of the reason why. So a busy, a, a busy household. My parents uh, did not get the chance to go to university, but were committed that we would get the chance, and so they worked very hard and we all worked very hard to, to go to university. So all six of us went to university. I went I went to, to Mount Allison University for my undergrad because my phys ed teacher in Labrador went there as a uh, soccer coach and he took, he got my brothers to go. We all played sports and then I went on a scholarship there quite a, um, which was really nice. But I also had to work because my parents had absolutely no money. So I had a student loan and I, worked 40 hours a week and I ran the canteen uh, for the arena. I was a dishwasher in the cafeteria and I worked every banquet um, as a server. So I, I tried really hard to, to be able to get through university and I did. And so then my journey went on. But my childhood had a huge impact. My parents, uh, we grew up what probably today you would say was poor, but we never knew that. We grew up with not very much. We didn't have a car, didn't have a TV, didn't have a lot, but uh, my parents encouraged us to get engaged and involved, and Labrador City was a fabulous place to do that as a child. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that with us. So when you were a child, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I, oh, that's an easy, easy, easy question. I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I used to, that was my passion, is. To be a veterinarian but when i went to university there was no one in my family who had gone to university and i didn't understand university very well and we didn't have the student supports uh, you know in the 1970s that we have now so when i went and i went to register they asked me what i like to do and i said i, I, I was a, a ferocious and am a ferocious reader i said i would love to read so they enrolled me in english I did not make the connection uh, that, you know, an English degree would not be the best degree to get to veterinary medicine. So I, but I loved my degree. I learned so much. So I did English and psychology degree. And I'm so glad that that path was open for me. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I guess that kind of goes to show that, you know, um, everything happens for a reason. Um, and, you know, Literature um, didn't lead you to veterinary school, but look where it did lead you. Yeah, that's um, true. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Um, so what does leadership mean to you? And that might be a big question. Um, so if you don't have a specific answer, that's okay. But right now, what does leadership mean to you? So I think a lot about leadership in the role. And I, you know, there's two things I wanna chat about with, um, with all 26 of you. One is, um, you know, people say to me often, you know, what kind of a leader do you try to be? And it's truly try to be. Uh, that's a, that's important to know that for any leader, you know, it's you're still trying and learning all the time. So I, I'm I believe I'm a believer in a leadership with integrity, sort of authentic leadership. And that's hard. That may sound well. That would be easy, but it's really tough sometimes to to go that path because you know to you know, sometimes you have to commit to something and uh, you may have to have to back out of that or not be able to keep your word and then you can be challenged around integrity. So that's something that I'm always striving for and to be authentic because um, one is a woman and as a woman who comes from uh, a background that many, uh, you know, many university presidents have not come from, you know, sort of the blue collar grassroots background, I want to be authentic to that part of my life and the part of my person. And um, you know, the other is I, my great great grandmother was from Con River, uh, Marie Therese Benoit, and uh, you know, so I am of a Mi'kmaq ancestry. And I say I, I, I say clearly I'm of Mi'kmaq ancestry because I was not raised with the culture, because my father had great shame uh, that he had Mi'kmaq, that he was of Mi'kmaq descent. And so it was very much hidden in my family and not talked about. And um, so trying to be authentic is trying to be authentic to myself, to my story, 
you know, to, to my womanhood, to who I am, and um, just be able to show students that you, you become a leader uh, and, and there's no template for leader. There's no mold. So last year I was talking to grade four students and I went in and I got introduced the, as a university president. And one of the little boys went like this. He went, what? And I said, I said, you look surprised that I'm the university president. He goes, I am. And he got kind of red in the face. And I said, are anybody else in here surprised? Put your hands up. And so some kids, you know, timidly put their hands up. And I said, now tell me, tell me what you think a university president would look like. So he said, taller. I thought a university president would be taller. And then a little girl said, I thought a university president would wear glasses. And then another child said, gray hair. And then another child said, a man. And, and that tells you that in 2019, there's still a vision of a leader as a tall man with gray hair and glasses. Well, I'm not that. I don't look like that. So, you know, to be authentic to, to who I am is to say that, you know, there's no, there's no formula for a leader. It, it, you know, it can, a leader can look many different ways and it's important that our students know that and learn that and understand it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, you know, leadership takes no one physical form and I think it's really important um, and awesome of you to really, um, I guess, shine the light on that. Um, and, you know, for those kids, especially, um, I guess, you know, you being the educator um, and letting them know that is going to make a huge difference because as they grow up, you know, they won't be expecting this tall, gray haired man. Um, and rather they will um, see leaders differently, but also maybe see that they themselves can be leaders. Um, so thank you for, I guess, you know, sharing that um, and for making that a mission of yours. That is wonderful. Um, I am surprised so that they think a leader should be taller than me because I, I know I'm not physically very tall, but I think tall. And I'm always surprised how short I actually am when people point that out to me. <laughs> how tall are you? All right, Lindsay, come on. I'm five, three, four, you know, it's, uh, tall enough. But I think <laughs> yeah. I, I'm an over six footer thinker. There we go. And that's all that matters. <laughs> um, so next question, uh, who is a leadership role model for you? Well, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. I had a leader that I thought was amazing. I don't, my field of research is children with disabilities. I started working with children with disabilities when I was 16 years old and it was, it's been my passion my whole life. And, um, I don't know if, if any of you know, put your hand up if you know Jean Vanier, the new of Jean Vanier. Yeah, he started the Larche movement, which is, he was, he was Canadian. He passed yeah. away a couple of years ago and he was my hero. He was someone I admired. Um, I, I thought he lived, walked and talked the values, you know, that he believed in. Uh, he was very, came across as very spiritual, committed his whole life to people with disabilities. He won the Humanitarian of the Year uh, about three years ago, which was like the Nobel Prize, but in the humanitarian area, and got like a million dollars for that. It, like he was just such a leader in the world. Um, and I got to go meet him. Uh, about four years ago, I ended up uh, in France and I contacted him and I had been writing him and I got to go spend a day with him and it was amazing. But last year it came out that he, um, have been involved in sexual exploitation of women, sexual abuse. And I was devastated. I was heartbroken. This man that I had such admiration for, I have a picture with him. I just, you know, all my life, I thought so much of him. Um, and I went through a lot of saying, should we have heroes? Like, is it, you know, is it the right thing for us to have heroes? And I've come to the conclusion that Absolutely, we should have have heroes, and he is no longer my hero. I, I, I he didn't walk, talk, and and you know emulate the values that he espoused. He he did not, and so um, he he is no longer my hero. But there are heroes everywhere, and uh, you know I know 
many I admire. Rick Hansen is a good friend of mine. The man in motion tour, do you remember? You might be too young, Lindsay, but he wheeled around the world, raising money for cancer. Do you know of Rick Hansen? No, I know no. you do. <laughs> um, he, I think it must be close to 30 years ago he did that, and, and he's very much a hero for me. And uh, so there are people that are extraordinary like him and like John Vanier that are heroes. But then there are so many heroes I meet every day. Um, I meet international students and I see there might, might there may be, I think, um, a couple that uh, might be online here, I don't know, but I see international students who leave their country, leave their homes, leave their friends and families, or halfway around the world to get an education. And I look at them and think about their bravery and their courage and how amazing that journey is. I think about what, how hard it was for me you know, to go to university and try to financially get through it and make it. And, you know, and my brothers, I look at my brothers and sisters and in their way, they were heroes, you know, uh, people who lift others up are heroes in my view. Sometimes I've had to be held up, not just lifted up. And the people that surrounded me uh, often are heroic in their compassion and in their empathy and in their understanding. So I, I, I see heroes all the time now. And uh, they're not the people you hold on a pedestal anymore. Uh, I'm not gonna hold those people up as heroes. I'm gonna hold the people who walk beside me shoulder to shoulder and uh, volunteer at, you know, at the local food bank or you know, just do such acts of kindness and generosity. They are heroes, everyday heroes. Absolutely. Um, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing that. Um, you know, everyone, I guess, has someone that they look up to and to have that kind of shattered, you know, I can't imagine how that must have felt. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. Um, and one question I will ask, I guess, is that, you know, if that were to happen to someone on this call, what would be one word of advice that you would give them to get through that? That challenging time? Well, you know, I'm not a I'm not a crier. I do not cry very often. I cried when I heard the news of John Vanier. I I saw like uh, from the time I was 16 years old, this man was someone I admired, and um, and when I spent that day with him, it was like uh, people would say I was with Nelson Mandela. You know that kind of um, w when you hit that depth of sadness, you again you need to. Sort of, my mother didn't give me much advice. My mother was it not a woman that gave advice. She had six kids in eight years. She was busy all the time. Um, some people that grew up with me in Labrador said, you know, she had a kind of a bark. But my mother told me once that you surround, that life is tough. And she said to me, well, you need to surround yourself with people who lift you up because you're gonna meet so many people in the world who, who wanna pull you down. And I, that's never left me. And I have had surrounded myself with people sometimes who haven't been positive or supportive and who took joy out of my uh, things that, that I was challenged on. And I learned to move away from those people. So my advice to students is always, surround yourself with people who lift you up um, because that is what you need in the world. And when you're going through a difficult time, like the shattering of your hero, you know, you can reach out to those people because that's what I did that day. I, oh, many of my good friends knew what I thought of Jean Vanier. I sent them the news release. I told them I was devastated and people, I felt surrounded by people who were there to hold me up and lift me up. And, you know, it took me about 48 hours and I was, I was finished with that. I was ready to move on and look for heroes in different places. Um, Shannon just uh, stuck a quote in there, surround yourself with people who lift you up. And, you know, thank you, Dr. Timmons, for sharing that because it, it's very true. Um, you know, when you surround yourself by people who um, don't lift you up or who drag you down, it, it's hard to get yourself up there. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for sharing that piece of advice uh, with us. Um, and I think it's one that it, it's certainly, you know, going to stick with me and I'm sure it's going to stick with a lot of people in this call. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so I'm not sure if, you know, this leads into uh, our next question or not, but what is an important point uh, for you in your leadership journey or what has been an important point or maybe some points if there's been more than one? Well, well there are numbers. From when I was, um, I think I've been able to achieve things because I have 
lifted my hand up. You know, I, I volunteered for things. I uh, stepped up when opportunities came along. I, sometimes I wasn't picked, but I, I was willing to learn and move and grow. Um, and I, I remember, you know, when I was, when I turned 40, that was a big deal for me. And I was so bored with myself. I thought, like, I couldn't stand to be around myself. I was not interested. I was working. I was raising four kids. But I had lost that kind of zest for life. And that life, life had almost become so routine. So when I turned 40, I said, that's it. I'm getting out of my box. I'm going to start to do things I didn't imagine I could ever do, with things that make me very uncomfortable. So when I turned 40, I, I learned to drive a motorcycle. And what I learned is that I never want to drive a motorcycle. <laughs> I got my license, I got my, did my course, and I, but I forgot to tell my family that. And on, on my 41st birthday, they all chipped in and bought me a little motorcycle. And I, I forgot to tell them that I didn't want to ever drive a motorcycle. But each year then I did something that I never thought I could do. And I did that for about four or five years and forced myself out of my comfort zone. And sometimes it was really uncomfortable and hard, you know, and I did, I did those things. So, you know, over the years I've learned it's a, what that taught me was, you know, be careful about, about stagnating, like push yourself a little bit. It, you know, it's easy to get comfortable. Everyone says to me, um, you know, all I want for my children is for them to be happy. I don't want my children to be happy. Now, that sounds terrible. I want my children to be excited, ecstatic, devastated, frustrated. I want my children to feel all of those range of emotions and experiences in life. And that's what I want for you students to feel. I want, <clears throat> I want you to feel enraged and, and about something, passionate about something, devastated about something. Life is so short. We, I, I want you to throw yourselves into living, and um, that's hard to do sometimes because we've been uh, we've been conditioned to be kind of, you know, not to rock the boat. You've heard that term. Don't rock the boat. Don't you know? Don't don't push yourself so hard. All of those comments, and uh, I I want for you students to feel it, all of that range of emotion and uh, to live that amazing life. Um, that, that's there for you to do. So I hope I hope you do that. Other leadership tips. I learned this one. If you see trouble, run towards it. So that's a, I always when you know things are blowing up, people think, oh my God, what are you going to do? And I always say, I'm going right. I'm running right towards it because that's another thing. You know, I've learned that you can't run away from it. They'll catch up with you. So deal with issues head on. And uh, be, if you're vulnerable, then you're vulnerable. And you'll have to, people, people can be wonderfully generous. They also could be, can be very nasty. And uh, you need to, you need to be able to, to handle all of that. That's part of that living life to its full. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Timmons. Um, and I think, um, you know, something that stuck out to me uh, that you mentioned is that, you know, when you hit 40, um, you felt like, you know, life was just getting dull. Um, and I think a big problem that students face is that, you know, um, whether they're doing this, you know, at 20 years old or 40 years old, um, you know, one year is such a critical difference. So, you know, maybe it's not getting accepted into a program or maybe it's, you know, grades just not being uh, what they should have been in that semester. Um, and, you know, it, it gets a lot of students down. Um, but I think it's real important, um, you know, like what you said is that, you know, you hit 40 and you realize that things weren't what you wanted them to be. So you took charge and you changed that. Um, and you know, at 41, when you got that motorcycle, um, it might not have been, uh, the change might not have been the change that you wanted, um, but you still went with it. And you know, you made a nice four or five years out of driving that motorcycle. Um, How did you know that, Lindsay? When my son turned 16, he said to me, I can't wait to drive your motorcycle, mom. That gave me, the, thank God it gave me a reason to sell it. It. I sold it that day. <laughs> so has he continued to drive motorcycle? No, I don't drive motorcycle now. It's too scary. I, uh, I, um, I believe in trying new things and getting out of my comfort zone. But when you realize that's the kind of trouble I don't want to run towards, right? Is riding a motorcycle. It's just not in your hands anymore. 
um, it, it's a real, it's, it's tough, you know. The other thing I think for students is when you talked about, Lindsay, students who get that, don't get accepted in that program or get that difficult mark. And one of the things I've also learned is that when things are going well, it's easy to have character, right? It's easy to be dignified and to be classy and to have character when things are going well. When things are not going well, that's when you have to dig deep. And that's when you have to find that character because you're easy, it's easy for you to blame others or to get to say, you know, I can't believe that happened to me. It should have. It's time to dig deep and say, okay, what? First you get mad. First you get mad. But then dig deep and that character needs to come out and think. What can I learn from this? I remember my son was running for student union, uh, student union vice president or president, and he didn't get it. And he he was devastated. Like I, I it it really hurt deeply. He had worked so hard campaigning, and I said that very thing to him: get angry, but no more than a couple of hours. Then I I said to him: you dig deep, and you find that character that I know is there, and you go congratulate your opponent, and you tell that your opponent, that you, or the person who won, that you're going to support them 100% and that uh, and that they can depend on you. And my son wasn't happy with me, but he did that. And the next year he ran for student union president and he got it, right? So you never know, right? The, the time of when you feel adversity, that's when uh, the real true character should, has to come out. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Timmons. Uh, we actually have a question uh, from someone uh, who's watching right now, and their question is, how do you deal with the risk associated with running towards danger? Oh, well, you know, that there's lots of risk um, in life, but I, I, I've learned that um, people say to me all the time, oh, you have to have a thick skin. If any of you follow me on Twitter, and I hope you do, you know that sometimes it can, it, it gets personal and it can get a little nasty. And it hurt, it does hurt. It, it it absolutely hurts. And sometimes it hurts deeply. Um, that's not what I'm talking about when I say run towards trouble. But when you have there's an issue, let's say there's um like uh, there's an issue uh, of a uh, 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 suspected fraud on campus. What I mean is run towards it. Is I, my belief is that you go right in there, you investigate, you find out what's going on, and you deal with it, right? And you take a risk, you might alienate people. People may want to hush it up and, and try to deal with it quietly. My belief is if there's, you know, if there's something that's gone wrong or an issue you're facing, tackle it, because it's it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. And so there, there are ramifications for doing that. And sometimes you will get lambasted in the media. Sometimes, you know, it, it will be really tough, especially if you had nothing to do with it as a president you wear everything right but it's still my belief that um that you you stand up and you and you take responsibility for things that happen in an organization that you lead absolutely um oh sorry i got another question coming in here um yeah so um you know like you said, um, just avoiding that conflict, um, it really gets you nowhere. Um, you know, dealing with it, um, at least, you know, taking responsibility, like you've said, um, at least sometimes it comes with a resolution. Um, it might not always be what you want it to be, um, but by just kind of avoiding it, it's not going to go away. It's still there. Um, so thank you for sharing that analogy with us. Um, and we have another question here now. Um, how do you, um, Sorry, how do you manage to feel comfortable in an environment where your peers do not look like you, who do not have the same backgrounds? I'll tell you, sometimes it's tough. I'm at many meetings where, you know, it's predominantly men. And, um, and, and it is, it's had its moments over the years. You know, often traveling as a woman president, if I'm with a male staff member, colleague, many of the male presidents I meet around the world are more comfortable talking to, to the, uh, uh, the, a man if he's accompanying me, right? Um, and so I've had to deal with that over the years. And, you know, I try to be understanding, but I also try to be um, strong and assertive and uh, portray confidence. Right? But there's been some tough times. I remember as a brand new university professor, my baby was three months old and I was nursing. And I was pumping 
uh, milk at work and putting it in the fridge in little baby bottles. And uh, I was told by uh, the chair of the department that it made the men uncomfortable when they opened the fridge and saw the breast milk in the baby bottles. And so could I not do that anymore? I remember you're, you're kind of a brand new job. It was a brand new job I had. Uh, uh, you know, three kids, uh, four kids, the youngest three months old, it was so tough. And I remember having a few tears and thinking, what am I going to do? I want, I want her to have to nurse on breast milk. So I, I ended up getting, a, for, for 24 hours, I had to figure out a plan, but I got a, a mason jar and put the milk in the mason jar in the fridge well, until I got a cooler. And I walked into the staff room and there was one of the male professors pouring milk from my mason jar into his coffee. And so I have learned that um, sometimes when things are tough, as a woman, you have to laugh and you have to, you have to recognize it. I, I am going to always face gender bias. It's there. Look at those little grade four kids. It's ingrained in us. Race, gender, homophobic, right? all of that. That's how we've been raised by society. What do we value, right? When we look at what we, what's valued in society, it often, you know, isn't us. So, you know, I've learned that I'd have to, I have to be strong. I have to confront um, injustice if it's, if it's blatantly in front of me. I have to challenge it. I have to name and shame it. But sometimes I have to manage within it, right? So I don't have a one solution to that. Um, but as, as a woman, I've been at meetings where I walked in, I remember walking into one of my first meetings and I was told, I, the person, Saw me, one of the gentlemen said to me, one of the male uh, leaders looked at me and said, can you make sure when you bring the tea that there's some herbal tea with it, please? And um, I said, sure, but I'm not bringing tea. Uh, you know, uh, do you know who I can speak to for on your behalf? Like I didn't, I didn't know, I was kind of surprised, but he assumed, but quickly assumed that I was not, you know, um, joining them for their meeting and I was not one of them. I have thousands of those stories, Lindsay. And sometimes you just have to laugh because there's nothing much else you can do, right? It's true. Um, I guess it's one of those things where um, there's no point in really getting down about it. And, you know, it really demonstrates, I guess, um, your leadership skills and how strong your leadership is that, you know, you don't let those things get you down. Um, and that, you know, you, you tell them as well. So like, you know, when that person asked you about the tea and you were like, great, but who can I speak to? Um, rather than just saying, you know, okay, or, you know, just not, I guess, fighting the injustice. So, um, you know, thank you, um, you know, on behalf of women even uh, for, you know, fighting that change um, and for, you know, just always voicing your opinions and telling us those stories. Uh, because, you know, some folks also would kind of, not tell those stories and just kind of keep them to themselves. And I think it's it's wonderful that you're willing to share those with us um, because, you know, it really does show, um, I guess, the problems that do exist in society, but also um, how we're able to try and at least make do uh, with what we've got and how to try and overcome them, be the, the shakers of the boats. So thank you, Dr. Timmons. We have another question. Um, so as a leader, um, obviously you face a lot of critics and taunts. Sometimes it causes mental breakdown. How do you manage those? Um, oh, sometimes this can be really nasty. There was a, I often do presentations on leadership and I decided to do one on managing social media. So I started collecting all the tweets about me and I put them into different categories. So gender tweets about gender, my gender and tweets that were positive and tweets that were just plain negative. And I remember doing a presentation at a senior women academic administrators conference and they were giving me an award and my mother was there. And she was in the front row and I gave this presentation and I showed some of the nasty tweets. And one of them said, what idiot would name their mother, or would name their child by an end? Which is my name, right? And my mother's sitting in the front row. Uh, my mother started to cry, She she just, and she said, I'm that idiot. And, and I said, Mom, this isn't about you. It's okay. It's okay. But she found it very hard. So I think for me, what I um, what I try to do is see a balance. So when those taunts and those negative, I get just as many, Lindsay, accolades. But you know that for every negative comment, it takes five or six positive 
to kind of eradicate the hurt that you feel from the, the negative. So I do I do try to remember there's a ton of there's still positive out there, and um, uh, but I wouldn't say that it doesn't affect me. It it does hurt. It it really it can be it hurts me. It hurts my family, my children. There have been such nasty things put out there that have been untrue, and my kids have had to you know deal with them. Uh, when my daughter was at school, other kids would say things to her about the stuff on social media that she had no knowledge or control of. So you know, it is hard. It's hard on my mother who now follows social media <laughs> and sees all the. The, the the good the bad and the ugly I call it. So I, I would say that I, I don't know if we ever get immune to it. I I think as human beings, uh, you know, we want to be kind and, and generous of spirit. I am. I try always to be kind and generous of spirit. And it, I don't understand. Uh, I, I I don't understand the nasty part of the world that's out there. I understand anger. I understand frustration. And I want to have a dialogue with people who who feel those things, uh, but a dialogue is not an attack. And so I figure if I can emulate always an openness to a discussion, but I'm not going to engage in social media. If any of you follow me, you notice I won't engage if I'm not if I know it's not it's not it's not a dialogue. If if something's put up there to be nasty or or to trap me or to force me to say stuff. If I say something, it's going to continue another attack. I'm not interested. So I'll just go silent on that. That's not, uh, you know, remember I said, surround yourself with people who lift you up. It's the same on social media. Do not engage in, in conversations that are hurtful and you know that the person isn't looking for a conversation. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Timmons. And you know, I think that's something that a lot of people can kind of um, relate to. I mean, you know, even if, uh, you know, people haven't been called out specifically on social media, um, you know, I think just, you know, seeing those hatred posts can just be hurtful. Um, and it's hard to kind of, you know, um, I guess put that aside or, you know, um, really deal with that. Um, but I appreciate you sharing um, your story with us and, you know, just admitting to the fact that it does hurt and that, you know, it's not one of those things that you can just deal with and it's going to be okay. Um, it does hurt. And I think, you know, something that a lot of people don't recognize a lot is that, you know, hurt happens and it's going to happen. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so the next question that I do have for you, um, and this might be uh, going back to what your mom said uh, to you when you were a child, but what is the best piece of advice that someone has ever given you? Wow, um, uh, another piece of my mother. <laughs> when I, I turned 18, my mother uh, said to me, uh, and you may meet my mother because she's she'll be coming over. She's in Nova Scotia now, but she'll be coming here and hanging out at events and stuff with me. She said to me when I turned 18 on my 18th birthday, instead of saying, well, first of all, she gave me a suitcase for my 18th birthday. And then she said to me, you know, Bayan, uh, a lot of people go through life uh, sad, angry at what happened in their childhood. You're 18 now, and every every behavior you, you exhibit from now on is yours to own. And up until you were 18, I, I'll take blame for things. But after 18, I'm not taking any blame for anything. It's all on you. If you don't like something in, that you do or that you feel, then you change it. It's yours to own. And, um, and and she, my mother growing up was not affectionate and she loved my brothers. And she would say that to you today if she was here with it. She loved the boys. She found me challenging because uh, I was more, um, she used to say dramatic. I said, I felt things deeply. So my mother, I wasn't her favorite. And, and she, and that was fine. But when I turned 18, she said to me, I don't want you going through life saying, you know, oh my God, poor me. My mother didn't hug me enough or love me enough. She said, I probably didn't, but from now on, you own your behavior. You own your reaction. You own your emotions. They are yours and you're 100% in control of them. And so that was a pretty powerful 18th birthday message. And the suitcase was a powerful message too. 
Absolutely. It was like a double, double big message. Um, thank you. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to, you know, what you said a few minutes ago as well about, you know, there's people on social media and, you know, when people say hurtful things, um, you know, you can own your emotions and you can own what you say and how you react to things. Um, and it's, you know, super important. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I think I also speak on behalf of everybody here that we are thrilled and we'll be super excited to meet your mother. My mother is so sweet. When you meet her now, that's not the woman who raised me, by the way. She is so, we're best friends now. She is so sweet and she loves parties, loves university parties. So she'll come to everyone she can. Yeah, she'll be there and you'll meet her and you'll think, she just gave up downhill skiing last year and she's 86. Wow. She won't, Lindsay, she won't give up her spin class. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. I hope at 86, I'm still going to spin class. <laughs> wow, awesome. Um, yeah, so I mean, when she does come, please bring her um, because we would love to meet her. Um, maybe, you know, once things get, you know, however things go, uh, maybe we can all go to the works and have a spin class with your mom. Oh yeah, you can. I'm not going to spin with her, but you absolutely could. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Um, so we have another question. Um, so you had to manage and balance many different stakeholders as a leader. How does a good leader manage through different stakeholder feedback and make the right decision? That's that's really tough. A lot of leaders want to lead through consensus, and I haven't. That hasn't been my way. Most of the decisions. Um, I've been part of have been through consensus, but I'm not married to consensus because I want difference of opinions. I want people to disagree. I want people to challenge me. You know, I want people. You know, they use the term "speak truth to power," and so I, you know, I don't. I don't always want to compromise, right? And consensus and compromise can often happen together. Um, but I also want to hear views and I want to, as a leader, make sure that people feel no matter what, that they're heard. Not that I follow the direction that they're asking me to, but that they honestly can feel that I've heard them. So I would say, and see that a lot of what, you know, you, a lot of what I, I look for is uh, different ways to lead. Sometimes I want to lead from ahead in front. Sometimes I want to lead shoulder to shoulder with people, but other times I want to lead from behind. You know, and I want I want to have others out in front uh, having the opportunities and taking uh, having the situation. But no matter where I lead from, I want I want people to feel that they can uh, speak their truth. And that's hard. I, I'm always surprised when people say to me, "I'm so nervous coming to speak to you," because uh, you know you have, and it's not me, Vianne, they're nervous about. It's a position, and sometimes I forget that they get. They get intermingled, right? And that you also have to have respect for the position and try to bring your authentic self into that. But I, as a leader, I, don't, I want people to, to be able to tell me what they think. That's the way you get, and I want diversity, right? That's, I'm a great believer in diversity of having people, surrounding myself with people who have diverse experiences, diverse, come from diverse places, have diverse stories, um, I think richer decisions come out of that. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, one view um, is just one view, right? So having um, all those different people being able to collaborate um, or at least help you make the decisions that you make um, or, you know, maybe even sometimes change your perspective on things are super important. Um, and I really like what you said about, um, you know, how you lead, uh, because oftentimes people think that the leader is always in the front. Um, but that's that's not always the case. Um, so I appreciate you um, bringing that up. Um, and we do have um, another thing here from someone who is viewing. Um, so you mentioned that you want many different perspectives. So what are your tips for dissolving conflict in a professional way while also allowing discussion and dialogue? Well, I have, there's one simple one that I have. If I'm on my senior team, I see, two people getting into real conflict, I'll say you take that off offline. Like, you don't, we don't need to have, if there's a personal conflict or, or not personal or even professional, but it's just two people at it, I'll say, we'll come back to this issue, but you two go resolve it. Because um, 
there's nothing better than two people sitting having a cup of, cup of coffee and working through things. So that's really important that there's space and time to do that. That would be one way. Um, the other is to be really clear about the rules. I'm going to listen to all your opinions, but ultimately I'll make the decision. And that it may, it may not be by con consensus so that people go in knowing the rules and with the expectation on how it's going to unfold. It, it, there's nothing worse than if you think you're working towards consensus and it doesn't happen, then you're, dev like, you're thinking, well, that's what leadership with integrity is about, right? You say what you're going to do when you try your best to do it. So that I think is important, um, is that you, you set the rules out right in front, say, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and then the outcome will be the outcome. Absolutely. So taking that charge. Um, thank you, Dr. Timmons, for sharing that. Um, we have another question. Um, whose advice do you listen to when you make hard decisions? Or who do you go to? Uh, who's your person, even? I don't know if I have a person that I go to when I make hard decisions. Um, if I have to make a hard decision, I want to go through to a variety of people. Like, I want to I wanna shoulder tap a few people to help work through it. And then I want to go on a long walk with my dogs and weigh it all and think about it um, and then make the decision. So I don't have a go-to person. And I think some people would have. Um, I, I do not have. Sometimes if it's around things with students and youth, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll call my son or my daughter who, you know, are in their 20s and ask them about it, like, and they're fierce social justice advocates. So they, they'll challenge me sometimes. If it's, um, you know, I may call another president, another, I had Elizabeth Cannon was a good friend of mine. She was the president of University of Calgary. Sometimes I would call her um, if it was a gender and leadership issue, just to talk it through. So I would have, I would have different people I would call for different issues. Wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, dogs make lovely companions. Um, so I appreciate that you mentioned your dogs as well. Um, and I'm going to ask, what are your dog's names? So I have a little Shih Tzu whose name is Kitten. Oh. And uh, she is very cat-like. She's a bit, uh, she's a bit of a snot. She doesn't, she's not warm. She doesn't jump up on my lap, but she lets me know when, when she's happy and when she's not. And then I have a Portuguese water dog and her name is She Bear. And she is a lap dog. She's a 40 pounder, but she is the most affectionate, a lap dog, a kisser, a hugger. So um, I got a little dog because I wanted a lap dog and I needed hypoallergenic so because of um, allergies. Well, it turned out, and then I wanted a bigger dog to run with. So um, I run with both of them, but my kitten, the dog is definitely not a dog. I don't know if because I named her, she turned into a cat. I'm not sure. sure. Do they get along well? Very, very well. As, as well as anyone could get along with Kitten. She's not the warmest dog in the world. She's quite aloof. <laughs> that is too cute. Um, thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Um, my cat's name is Cat. Um, so I think it's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> that your dog's name is Kitten. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. And I guess I am looking at the time. We have 10 minutes left. Um, so I will say if anyone who's viewing has any more questions, just direct them to Shannon. Um, but one that I do have here, um, Dr. Timmons, is how can your story inspire students to launch forth on their own leadership journey? So, uh, you know what? I have what I call... Uh, I'm a product of the Canadian dream. I believe that to be true. You know, I remember my grandfather as a coal miner. You know, I remember how hard it was, uh, a life for him. And, uh, you know, my grandmother was pulled out of school in grade four to become a housekeeper. You know, that is, these are the people whose shoulders I stand on. I can remember my mother coming to one of my university classes that I was teaching. And she, she, you know, she'd never been on a university campus. And for her, she got in, she got to sit in a big auditorium of about 160 students I was teaching and listen to me lecture. And 
but she was in awe. And I just thought, but you know, I, I've stood on your shoulders. You're the reason I'm here. So for university, I would say to students, you know, um, I know things that can be tough. I, my memory of, you know, not having enough money and worrying whether I'd be able to get groceries to get me through the week, that was my story. And um, the thing is, remember when things are tough, that's when you dig deep and you pull out that resilience that's, that's inside of you and that character that's there and you problem solve and figure it out. And you never, never, never regret putting your hand out and asking for help. That is, I have had to do that so many times in my life, putting my hand out and asking for help. And that's a sign of character, that's a sign of strength, um, and that's a sign of a good leader to know when you need to put your hand out. And so I mean, I would say to students, remember that, you know, uh, if, when times are tough, that's when you learn and you build those strategies that are gonna help you succeed. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Timmons. Um, and, you know, that is super important because I think, you know, something else that a lot of folks struggle with is asking for help. Um, you know, help is seen, help is seen, sorry, as a sign of weakness sometimes, uh, but that's not at all the case. Um, so I appreciate you shining light on that fact. And, you know, asking for help is, it's, it's part of being human. Um, and there's help out there. There's help on campus. There's lots of help on campus. But there's help in the community if you're not comfortable asking for help on camera. There, there are so many organizations that are there to wrap themselves around you and hold you up or lift you up. Absolutely. Going back to the lifting us up. Surround yourself by people who lift you up. Um, thank you, Dr. Timmons. And I will actually ask a question. How do you self-care? How do you um, recommend that you know viewers here uh, self-care um, you know what is one thing that maybe you do that you could share with others I'm not very good at that Lindsay and I will say that that's something I'm, I'm really working hard on is to to take better care of myself um, uh, uh, I mentioned walking with the dogs or running I, I ended up doing quite a bit of running and I I found that that solitude really helped me mentally I'm also a big reader so those are the things that I would do people think I'm an extrovert, but I don't get my energy from people. Um, I enjoy being around people. I get my energy uh, by, by solitude from reading a book, having a bath, taking the dogs for a walk, uh, going for a run. So that's where I try to, but you know, I don't eat as healthy as I should. I don't exercise as healthy as I should. So when I got this job, I decided I was going to do a big reset. So I bought a year's membership at a gym and I booked. I, I paid for upfront 10 sessions with a personal trainer and the pandemic hit. And so I'm waiting for the chance to implement that reset in my life. Hopefully, hopefully it'll come soon. Um, what's your favorite author? I guess I should ask. That was a question uh, that just came up. You know, you mentioned that you um, do or sorry, uh, did a lot with literature and that you love reading. So who is your favorite author? Or do you have a book that you could recommend? Well, I'm gonna get you um, what I carry with me wherever I go. And you know what this is? The Kindle. And I have probably, in my Kindle, probably 3,000 books. And so I don't have a favorite author. Um, just like heroes, I find, good writers in so many genres i read i like science fiction i like mystery i like intrigue i like um people's stories um i'm a best seller junkie i read you know the globe and mail bestsellers and um, i download those books so i uh, i don't i i think there are so many fabulous writers that now i've got to i've got to read up on all the newfoundland folklore and history and there's so many authors here in Newfoundland that are beautiful writers that I want to. Somebody said, type that up. Shannon said this. Lots of writers in Newfoundland. Um, yeah, you should. You should uh, send me some. Everyone here, you should send me a Newfoundland book that or author that you like so I can read up. We'll get that collection for you and we'll make sure that you get it. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at the time. There's four minutes left. Um, 
so I guess I just want to say thank you, Dr. Timmons, um, you know, for being not only the first uh, guest here on our Launch Forth Leadership Series, um, but for also just taking the time to talk about leadership with us and tell us about your journey and, you know, tell us about those vulnerable points. Um, you know, it's been very eye opening and inspiring to me, as I'm sure it has been to everybody here um, who is viewing today. Um, so thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to do this with us. Um, so what and I was, it, did you guys, I mean, did any of you learn anything? If you could think of one thing that you will remember from this hour, just type it in quickly so we can see it. Wonderful. So as people type, I guess I'll say the, you know, lift, stay around people who lift you up uh, was a huge one for me because it's so easy to surround yourself by negativity um, that I think it's super important to just, you know, surround yourself by people who will lift you up and who will support you and be there for you. Um, so, you know, I think that was a big one for me. Lindsay, you stole one of one of them. Vulnerability is okay. Good. <laughs> but I always think if I spend time, an hour with you, all I want you to do is take away one thing. One thing that will resonate with you. One thing that maybe you can think of when you encounter a situation and you think, oh, I remember that saying. So, uh, hope that's okay. You have, um, you have, uh, quality rather than a huge quantity here listening to you today every single person who is here is a leader in this community either alumni or senior student or staff and we are very privileged to have you here and and taking your words and your approach you know it's important to understand how different approaches are, are made and we, we we really appreciate that i think you set uh, a high standard for the rest of the uh, the leadership series as we go forward for sure um this is being recorded as well so we can share it as well with students who weren't able to be with us today and i think it is a case study in um in in in, in exploring and delving into a leadership style um which is quite important so I do thank you very much. And Lindsay, uh, thank you, Lindsay, as well for, for mediating this. This is wonderful. Well, thank you, Lindsay and Shannon. You know, this day and age when things are so fast moving, the greatest gift you give someone is your time. And each of you gave me one hour of your time. And uh, thank you for that very precious, precious gift. And I, um, I accept it with grace. So I appreciate it so much that you gave me that. I'm going to unmute you all if you want to say hello. How's Every that? now and again, I'll say, okay, I'll make it on the schedule. But yeah, he's been really, uh, he's been really good at planning it out, which is nice. Okay, I'm not going to be very helpful. I'm going to meet you all again. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> later. Okay, please, please. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Well, I'm going to just see, uh, I just Do you want to say thank you for uh, sharing everything that you have with us within the last hour. Um, I'm from Goose Bay, Labrador, originally. Hi, Brianna. Hi. <laughs> but I'm, I moved here when I was quite young, but I, I do I do resonate with, you know, where that might not have been, you know, when I was younger now, I, I know times are different, but I know my parents certainly would resonate with everything you said, and uh, I just really appreciate everything that you taught me in the last hour. I like it. I like it for you. You went for All right. Grant, so that was chaos. Okay, that's absolutely my fault, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I shan't do that anymore. <laughs> oh gracious. Well, thank you ever so much for, for yourself. Thank you, everyone. And thank everybody. you for being so kind. Thank you. Um, we will see each other again, no doubt about it. And uh, I can't about, wait. Yeah. <laughs> and talk about so. your dogs and, and running and everything else. So it's Thanks, all good. Bye bye. Take care to all. Okay. Thank you ever so much. Bye bye now.